All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to your Module 7 notes. These are on evolution and speciation, which is the generation of new species. Let's get right into it. Here is our table of contents. We are going to begin with um, sort of defining biodiversity and quickly defining what a species actually is. And then this term speciation, which is how do we get new species? How do we like add species to the library of species on earth? Then we'll do a little bit about evolution in natural selection. Not too much detail here. You've done this in bio, you've done this a lot. Um, so there are a few concepts that we will emphasize and put into context. And then we'll have talk about reductions in biodiversity and extinctions, um, things that topic. And then one topic at the end called island biogeography. Islands have slightly unique um, circumstances because they are so isolated. Um, and so we'll sort of talk about what promotes or restricts biodiversity in islands. So let's get into here. The basic question that we're talking about here is like, if you look around Earth today, you look out the window, um, if you look under a microscope in some soil or whatever, you will see so many different forms of life. The diversity of life on Earth is kind of astonishing. But if we go back to the beginnings of life on Earth, once upon a time, a very long time ago, sometime, well, let's say like four billion years ago, something like that, we had the very first form of life. How did we go from that very first form of life, whatever that first thing was, some bacteria, to the incredible diversity that we see today? How did that happen? How did we become so biodiverse? First, Let's define what a species is, because when we're talking about biodiversity, we're talking about number of different species. Well, let's be sure we know what a species actually is. Here is going to be our working definition. It is a group of organisms that can reproduce with each other and produce fertile offspring. A group of species that can reproduce with each other and produce fertile offspring. That is the definition we are going with. I feel like I hear some of you grumbling, but wait, aren't there some ish, aren't there some other things that are going to cause a problem with this definition? What about asexual species like bacteria? They don't reproduce, they reproduce asexually. What about grizzly bears and polar bears? They can actually have fertile offspring, but we still consider them different species. I hear you grumbling. Just stop grumbling. We don't care. Just, just, we're just, we're just Xing these questions out. It is true. What a species is, is more nuanced than this definition, but we're keeping it simple. We are going with this one species that can reproduce and produce fertile offspring. Let's continue. Look at these guys right here. Look at this thing. Look at this thing top left. That is called a zorse. Because obviously humans did this because we got bored. We wanted to see what would happen if a horse and a zebra mated. It worked. That's real. That's not Photoshop. That's a real thing. This right here is a mule in the top right. That is a cross between a donkey and a horse. You guys know what this is? It's ever, pretty much everyone's favorite animal. That is a liger, a cross between a lion and a tiger. And this you might have eaten, you might have bought it at the store. That is a plum cot. That is a cross between a plum and an apricot. We can make a zorse, but a zebra and a horse are not the same species. Why? Let's go back here, second half, and produce fertile offspring. The zorse is sterile. You cannot make a new source by mating two sources. It doesn't work. Nothing happens. The source is sterile. The mule is sterile. The ligar is sterile. And if you take the plum cot pit and plant it in the ground, nothing will happen. It is sterile. Therefore, plums and apricots are different species. Horses and zebras are different species. Let's go on to our next question. So how do we get a new species? If that's our definition. If we have like, if an, if two different species mean they can't successfully reproduce with each other, well, how do we get new ones? And this is a process called speciation. 
new species arising from an ancestor. All right. So you know how like we and chimpanzees, we share a common ancestor, but humans and chimpanzees had not successfully procreate. Nothing, nothing happens. We can't even make a humanzee. We're not nearly close enough. But we had a common ancestor. So what happened that made us so different? We have two phases. And one is going to be geographic or reproductive isolation. So we can have two types of speciation, which are sympatric speciation or allopatric speciation. I'm going to actually start with allopatric because it sort of is the easiest to visualize. This is when two populations become physically isolated by some sort of barrier. So two groups of the same species break off from each other and can no longer get to each other. And so they evolve in isolation and then they build up mutations and they become different. Sometimes groups become isolated even when there is no physical barrier. And this is sympatric speciation, a change in appearance or behavior that isolates populations that are not physically separated. If this isolation goes on for long enough and it needs a long time, million years, couple million years, populations need to be in isolation, then mutations compile. And eventually the DNA of those, of those two populations that used to be the same species, eventually the DNA of those two species are so different that they can no longer successfully interbreed even if they were brought back together like us in a chimpanzee. We are too different. We cannot successfully breed because we've been isolated for too long or uh, reproductively isolated for too long. So let's visualize that a little bit. Here we have a pond of these orange and blue spotted fish down here on the left, we see allopatric speciation. Maybe the pond dries up a little bit. And instead of having one pond where all the fishies can mix up, now we have two separate ponds. And now the fish cannot mate with each other and they evolve in isolation. And one type of fish turns blue and one type of fish turns orange for whatever reason. And eventually give it a million years or so and they will become entirely different species. Or you can have what we see on the right, the sympatric speciation, which is when there is no barrier, but maybe there's some mutation and one group of fish turns blue. And the orange ones are just like, I don't know what's up with those blue guys. I don't like them. Orange fish, we don't hang out with the blue ones. Forget those guys. They can stay over there and do their thing, but we are not hanging out with the blue fish. And then they behaviorally just start to isolate from each other. And the orange fish don't hang out with the blue fish and the blue fish don't hang out with an orange fish. And that just becomes how it is and give it a million years or so and they become different species. And that's an example of sympatric speciation. Again, physical barrier forces isolation of populations. In this one, populations are not isolated but differences in appearance and or behavior cause populations to stop breeding. For a behavioral example, sometimes things evolve to be nocturnal and a different population is what we call diurnal, which means they're awake during the day and the nocturnal ones and the diurnal ones just never hang out with each other. And then they become, they have become um, speciated sympatrically. Moving on. So what drives natural selection? Why do these appearances sort of take hold in populations? Well, first of all, there is genetic variation within a population. Just look at the people all around you. Nobody is identical, save for identical twins. But nobody has the same genetics. We have uncountable numbers of differences in hair and appearance and skin in height and what like whatever and then internal things that you can't see there are genetic variations within a population and this is just sort of natural no two individuals are the same here we go here's an example we got a bunch of mice and all these mice look different they that's just natural variation some are dark some are white some are mixed some are brown whatever now 
every every organism has selective pressures and i'll give some examples of selective pressures but selective pressures are things that might kill you things you have to overcome in order to survive a good example for these mice are things trying to eat it there are eagles that are always going to try to swoop down and eat the mouse there are badgers there are snakes there are a lot of things trying to eat them so this genetic variation starts to come into play. We have this variation here. And if we look at this mouse right here, this is a light colored mouse. And look, it exists on a light colored rock. But now we have this dark colored mouse. And look, it lives in a different environment. The selective pressures for these guys are the same. It's predation. Things are trying to hunt them. It is not inherently good to be a light or a dark mouse. No one of those is like intrinsically a good thing. It depends on your environment. So if these guys are around, the traits that help the individuals in a population survive are called adaptations. And these adaptations are shared by offspring. Sorry, we got an announcement. That's Joseph Moore. That's Joseph Moore is the main office lead. Thank you. That was fun. Let's keep going. So have a look at these and think which ones are going to survive. The ones that the predators can't see will survive. That guy stands, sticks out like a sore thumb. The hawk's going to come in and gobble him up. The hawk's going to come in and gobble this guy up. These guys are more likely to survive. These guys are more likely to make it to, the, to reproduce, and then they will pass on their traits that have helped them to survive, where these guys get the ones that died, they get crossed out of the gene pool. They get eliminated from the gene pool. Selective pressures are environmental factors that make it hard to survive. Here are some examples. Food availability. Everybody's got to find food. Your ability to find that food or not find it will affect your survival chances. If you're good at finding it, you're more likely to survive. If you're not, you're not. Predation, your ability to avoid predation makes you more likely to survive. The climate can make it hard to survive. If it is really hot or really cold, that puts a selective pressure on you that you have to overcome. Competition with other species. If I am trying to eat the same food source as a different species, I'm in direct competition with them. And if, the, if my competitor is better at obtaining food than me, I'm in trouble because I might get outcompeted for food and starve to death. Adaptations are physical or behavioral traits that help you survive. They help you overcome these selective pressures. For example, ability to access food. Look at this giraffe. In the grasslands, in the savannas, these trees go very tall. The grass, the giraffe's food is way high off the ground. That's where its food is. It has adapted to be able to reach it. Very few other animals are able to access this food source. Camouflage helps you avoid predation. Look at this thing. It looks exactly like a leaf. How would a frog or whatever that likes to eat it try to see this thing? So this is an adaptation. It helps it survive. Temperature control. This is a polar bear's fur. It has multiple layers of very, very thick fur to help it overcome climate challenges. So those are examples of adaptations. There are many other examples. Now let's get to a key question. Why is there genetic variation in populations? Why are not all populations just clones of each other? This is sort of a boring answer, but it's just mutations. Every time you get a new individual, there will be mutations. There are always errors when you are cop uh, in DNA copying. Most of the time, those errors are meaningless. Sometimes those errors will kill you. Sometimes those errors won't kill you, but they will make you different. If that difference makes you less likely to survive, that mutation will probably be eliminated from the gene pool, but every once in a while, there is a random mutation that makes you more likely to survive, and that one makes you more likely to reproduce and pass on that gene. And now we have natural selection in motion.
The other thing that causes genetic variation is sexual reproduction. Not all organisms reproduce sexually. The ones that do combine genes in, the, to, in their offspring, and that creates new traits, new features. That genetic recombining of sexual reproduction creates genetic variation. So those two things create variations in a population, and that variation allows for the possibility of natural selection. I got a little flow chart to try to tie everything up. Why is there biodiversity? Well, there is biodiversity because there is natural selection. We had those mutations, natural selection, selects for certain mutations, speciation, and now we have like all these differences, okay? Let's keep asking the questions, like five-year-olds, why, why, why? Why is there natural selection? There is natural selection because there are different habitats and niches. If all of Earth was the exact same environment, we wouldn't have biodiversity. We would just have like a couple dominant species. There wouldn't be different natural environments to select for different things. But because we have deserts, because we have rainforests, because we have all these hot places, cold places, Different adaptations get selected for. We have these different habitats and niches, so different traits become selected for. That's why there's natural selection. Let's keep asking the why. Why are there different habitats and niches? Well, a bunch of different reasons. One is that there's different temperatures on Earth, and that's because the Earth is unequally heated. The equator gets the most direct sunlight. It is the hottest Though, as you go to the poles, it gets the coldest. Remember, Earth is tilted on its axis. That creates seasons as it rotates the sun. So we have these different temperatures. That is one thing that helps create different habitats. Remember that um, climate is temperature and precipitation. This is why there are different temperatures. Different uh Precipitation levels, this is what we just learned about with the Hadley cells and the tricell model and the Coriolis effect and the prevailing wind and water patterns and why different parts of the earth get different amounts of rainfall. So if we combine the uneven heating of earth by the sun along with the tricell model, we get our biomes, we get all these different um, environments that have so many different habitats and niches. Remember, that where what biome you are depends on your what latitude you are at and your altitude. Well, why are there land masses at different latitudes and altitudes? Why aren't all the land masses in the same place? That is because of tectonic movement. Why are there land masses at different latitudes? Because they are constantly moving around due to tectonic movement. All of these things conspire, the uneven heating of Earth, the tectonic movement, the tricell model creates the different niches, creates the opportunity for natural selection, and has created the incredible biodiversity that we enjoy here on Earth. Let's keep going, change our topic to reductions in biodiversity. The Earth is way more biodiverse than it was 4 billion years ago. However, it has not been a linear path. The biodiversity of Earth has not always just been going up and up and up. Populations that cannot adapt to their environment become endangered and may eventually go extinct. Disruptions to ecosystems. So if a habitat or a niche changes, this can push an organism outside what we call their range of tolerance. Any organism needs certain conditions to survive, needs a certain amount of rainfall, needs a certain amount, a certain temperature, needs a certain type of food, needs a certain pH of the water, whatever. So conditions like pH, sunlight, temperature, salinity, all these things exist, uh, create a range of tolerance for organisms. And if an organism, let's say some fish, if the water temperature becomes too acidic, if the pH drops too much, that fish will die. And if, the, if it stays like that too long, maybe that entire population will go extinct. So you have the optimum range for an organism where you see the greatest populations. 
But then if it gets pushed outside that optimum range, it'll be what's called a zone of stress and the populations decline a lot. The population is perhaps not extinct, but it might be endangered. And then if it goes even further, the zone of intolerance, you have extinction. Organisms cannot survive it. Going back to module four, we had our two terms, generalists and specialists. Generalists tend to have a wider range of tolerance. They can survive larger changes to conditions like pH, sunlight, temperature, salinity. So they can survive in many different conditions. Generalists are less likely to become endangered or go extinct. Specialists are the opposite. Specialists have a very narrow range of tolerance. They need a specific pH. They need a specific food source, a specific temperature. And if they do not have that, they can reach their zone of intolerance easily and are much more likely to become endangered or go extinct. There have been in the past five mass extinction events. Mass extinction events are caused when there is a really rapid change in environment that pushes a huge number of species outside their range of tolerance and they go extinct in very large numbers. We won't review all the mass extinction events. You can sort of see them here, biodiversity going up and up and up in every little dip, every number you see, that is a cratering of, di of diversity and represents a mass extinction. The most recent of which we are quite confident was caused by an asteroid impact. And this caused the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. That asteroid impact changed the habitat of Earth all over the place in a bunch of different ways that would have, there would have been this like enormous amount of heat that happened right after the impact that would have killed stuff. Dust and water vapor would have gone into the air and caused a rapid cooling of the environment as the sun was blocked out. And so the environment changed really, really quickly and things could not survive. One just side note, we always, we often say like, you know, this caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. It caused the extinction of most of the dinosaurs, but not all dinosaurs went extinct. Some dinosaurs survived, and they're still out there. Look out your window. Do you see a bird? A bird is a dinosaur. Birds are the dinosaurs that did not go extinct. Not all dinosaurs went extinct. Fun fact for you. Let's keep going. A common thought is that extinction is bad. This is a bad thing. Well, sort of. It's not like great to have all these things going extinct. However, it opens up niches and reduces competition. And this creates an opportunity for biodiversity to expand. Here's a really good example of this. When the dinosaurs went extinct, there were mammals. This is about what we looked like, our ancestors, our mammal ancestors, about the size of a paperclip. And we were subterranean. We lived underground. Why did we live underground? Because the dinosaurs were there and they were terrifying and they liked to eat us. So we didn't come out very much. And then this asteroid impact hits. And you know where the safest place on earth was when that asteroid impact hit? Underground, where we were hiding. And then it wiped all those suckers out and all those things that used to hunt us. Then we poked our heads out and there were no dinosaurs there anymore. And so we started hanging out above ground. And we started adapting and evolving. And we started changing. And we started living up in trees. And we started living in warm places and cold places and all over the places. And the mammals, the extinction of the dinosaurs, caused the proliferation of mammals. And here we are today. We are ancestors of the survivors of all the mass extinctions, including the one that killed the dinosaurs. And if the dinosaurs didn't go extinct, we would not be here today. There is a sixth mass extinction and it is happening right outside your window right now. This is what we are calling an anthropogenic extinction. You are gonna see this term a lot all year, so let's define it. It means human caused. This mass extinction is being caused by us. We are unbelievably 
successful animals. And we have proliferated and expanded at an astonishing rate. And we are big animals and we are hungry and we take over habitats. And as we take over habitats, other things lose their habitat. We don't like things that hunt us. So things that we see as threats, we go ahead and kill them. Like we used to walk around with saber tooth tigers and woolly mammoths and stuff, but they freaked us out. So we killed them all and now they're gone. We have caused and are continuing to cause a mass extinction events event. The, the human impacts and biodiversity are sort of abbreviated with this acronym HIPCO. So let's define it. H is habitat destruction. We do plenty of that. I is invasive species. As we move around, we take stuff with us where it is not native. And some of those invasive species get out and spread and outcompete native species and kill them. Population growth. There are more and more and more of us. A hundred years ago, there were a little over a billion people on earth. Right now, there's like 8.1 billion people on earth. That is a lot of mouths to feed. That is a lot of homes to, homes to build. That comes at the expense of other organisms. Pollution. We pollute. We burn our fuel. We make our waste. We pollute in many different ways. And that pollution can push organisms outside their range of tolerance. There is climate change also pushing organisms outside their range of tolerance in over exploitation. This is us going into habitats and extracting too much stuff thus changing habitats too much, changing environments too much, causing things to go extinct. One I just want to highlight, invasive species. This came up in module four, I think. Um, not all non-native non species are considered invasive. Some non-natives don't take over their invasive uh, their environments. Invasive species are usually generalists because they can really outcompete other organisms, and that competition leads to a loss of biodiversity. A few examples are lionfish. If you've ever snorkeled in the Caribbean, you might have seen one of these. These are invasive. They come from Asia. They come from uh, the like the South Pacific, that coral area, like the Indonesia area. Um, they are very territorial, they are pretty voracious eaters, and they are outcompeting fish, and so they are invasives. This is a plant called kudzu, which is not native to North America, and it is very good at competing for water and nutrients in the soil and outcompetes native plants, plants and overgrows everything. It does not really have native predators, so nothing reigns it in. Cats, your house cat. These are invasive species. They eat so many birds, so, so many. And so they are considered invasive species. And sometimes it can be argued that the human being is an invasive species. I'll leave you to, leave you to consider that. Are we an invasive species? We move into places and we outcompete things. So should we be considered an invasive species? Some people would argue yes. Some people would argue no. One thing that is not in that HIPCO, um, they have habitat destruction, but I just want to um, sort of talk about habitat fragmentation, not exactly the same as destruction, but we also fragment habitat. We break it up. So we have this big old habitat here, but sometimes we'll sort of puzzle piece it. We'll break it apart. Bigger contiguous habitat supports greater biodiversity. When you fragment it, you reduce niches, you reduce resource availability. We fragment it by building roads, by building farms, urban expansion. All these things will eat into a large habitat and kind of break it apart. And when you break it apart, organisms can't get from one to the other. So their, habit, their resource availability becomes limited and this also threatens populations. Every once in a while, so you see this big highway, that is a habitat fragmentor. Sometimes we do cool things. Look at this. See that bridge there? That's not a bridge for a road. That is a wildlife bridge so that wildlife can connect. The road is no longer fragmenting the habitat. Wildlife can connect from one side of the highway to the other. Sometimes we do thoughtful things like that, and that helps promote biodiversity. Few stats on the sixth mass extinction. If we look at extinction rates starting around 1900, 
and the um, Industrial Revolution. And that's when human population really started to expand and we really started to pollute more. Extinction rates really started to spike. Amphibians, mammals, and birds have the highest extinction rate among animals. Amphibians are particularly sensitive because they absorb stuff through their skin so they can be pushed out of their range of tolerance by pollution easily as they absorb toxins through their skin. Here's another way to look at it. Species threatened with extinction, 40% of plants, 35% of amphibians, 30% of corals, 22% of mammals. Um, extinction rates are extremely high. They are accelerating. There is a massive, massive loss of biodiversity happening right outside our windows right now. And what is unique about this one is this is being caused by a single organism on Earth, the Homo sapien, the human being. It is us. Moving away from such bleak topics. Finally, let's talk about island ge biogeography. Islands, the biodiversity on islands depends on two factors. The first one being the size of the island and the distance from the mainland. So here we see a couple islands here. Over here, if you see the left hand side, it says Mozambique, that is Africa. So that is the large continent. There is Madagascar and let's compare it to Mauritius. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Look, what, look which one is bigger. Madagascar is much bigger than Mauritius. And therefore, it has greater habitat diversity and resource availability. And therefore, it has more available niches. And therefore, it has more biodiversity. Madagascar is much bigger than Mauritius. So it will have much greater biodiversity. Not only is it much bigger than Mauritius, but, and I'll come back to this in a second, it is also much closer to the mainland of Africa than is Mauritius. So if we look at this one right here, we have island A, which is near the mainland, and island B, which is far from the mainland. The near one will have greater biodiversity because it's easier for species from the mainland to migrate over to the island A. It is much more difficult for a species native to the mainland to travel all the way to island B. So the closer you are to the mainland, the more biodiverse you will be because of ease of migration. Here's a little graph. As distance from the mainland increases, number of species decreases. Going back to this one, Madagascar, has way more greater biodiversity because it's much, much bigger and it is closer to the mainland of Africa. So that is our island biogeography. Another cool kind of funky thing about islands is they often have endemic species. This means species that only exist in that one place. You don't find them anywhere else in the whole wide world. The Galapagos Islands is a wonderful example of this. These are very isolated islands off the coast of Ecuador, but they're quite far, five, 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. Things did manage to migrate out there. Birds through storm, like stuff has made it out there, but they have evolved in isolation. And there are so many things that only exist there. The giant Galapagos tortoise only exists there. The marine iguana, this is this is an iguana that feeds on algae that lives on the seafloor, and it can actually swim through the ocean and dive underground. No other iguana does anything like this. The blue-footed booby, everybody's favorite animal. Look at its blue feet. They're adorable. They exist only there. This is the flightless cormorant. Look at it. Look at these dinky little wings. This cormorant cannot even fly anymore. It doesn't fly because it has no natural predators on this island, and it eats fish. Flight is useful for migration and evading predators. It doesn't migrate, and it doesn't have a predator. Flying is useless. It put all its energy into some big old thick legs so that it's an awesome diver. The flightless cormorant exists only here. These are all species endemic to that place. Endemic species are usually specialists because islands have very specific niches and habitats. So they are evolved to very specific conditions. Therefore, 
islands are particularly vulnerable to invasive species and other anthropogenic threats. If new competitors come in, they are in trouble. The Galapagos Islands has been very sensitive to this, including cats. People that moved there brought their pets and they got out and there are loads of feral cats and they look just like adorable house cats, but they are wild and they eat birds and they're having a grand old time on this island wreaking havoc and they're very threatening invasive species. That is the end of our lecture. I hope you enjoyed it.